Thank you all for coming. Uh, I am uh, Andrew Holland, Senior Fellow for Energy and Climate uh, and Director of Studies here at the American Security Project. Uh, we've got a great, uh, great event today and a great topic, uh, and happy to have you all here. Maybe I'll start by just introducing uh, ASP for those of you who uh, this is your first time here. Uh, American Security Project is a nonpartisan national security think tank founded about 10 years ago with the idea of bringing some long-term nonpartisan perspective to uh, national security policy, to look at the threats and the opportunities that we face <laughs> Uh, as a country and, a, and as a world. We've, uh, we've worked in a whole range of issues from nonproliferation to Middle East peace to uh, energy security to climate security, the subject of our, our talk today. Um, we, uh, on that subject, I, I, I should uh, mention that we've got a new paper out today uh, authored by myself and uh, Philip Rossetti, who is here someplace, yeah, uh, in the back, uh, on uh, uh, climate diplomacy as, as a uh, strategy for American leadership on climate diplomacy. And that's not to say that there is an American leadership already on climate diplomacy. It, it, it is happening and it is a, a notable change uh, from the last, uh, last several years, decade, uh, even more so. It's, it's wonderful to see American leadership on this. We, uh, we lay out a strategy in the paper, and I'd, I'd encourage you to go on our website to, uh, to take a read of it and, and uh, look through it. We think it's, it, this is something that isn't just for this administration to look at. This is something that both uh, that, that the next president and presidents for the next 50 years are going to have to be thinking about what is their strategy for climate diplomacy and what are, what are we going to have to be doing uh, about this. Uh, and it's going to be a bipartisan issue. It has to be. Uh, whether or not uh, it's talked about in the, in the primaries or in the, the campaigns, uh, the issue of governing events, dear boy events, are going to, uh, to force it on them. So. Uh, we're, we're pleased to have the report out, and, we're, and then we're pleased to have uh, Foreign Minister Tony DeBrum of the Marshall Islands here today to talk about climate diplomacy, the efforts that he and his nation, the Marshall Islands, have, uh, have raised about the, the threats of climate change to their, uh, their country, the threats of, of climate change to small island states around the world, and indeed to the, to the whole world. Uh, and uh, he himself has been one of the, uh, the real strong voices uh, advocating for leadership on, on climate change for a long time. Uh, I, I, I went back and I looked in February 2013, he addressed the UN Security Council on threats po posed uh, by climate change to global security. He was the main coordinator of the Marshall Islands hosting of the Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Meeting. Uh, later that year in 2013, which produced the Majoro Declaration for Climate Leadership. Uh, he's been engaged on these issues for a long time. And, and, and frankly, when, when we, uh, we did this event, uh, I, I was surprised by how many people reached out to me and said, oh, Tony DeBrum is wonderful. Thank you for having him. And, and thank you for, uh, for hosting him. And, and, and I look forward to, to seeing him. So th this is a, a great honor for me and for us here at ASP. Uh, everything here is on the record today. Uh, we are filming it. Uh, we, I, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Minister De Broome here, but then uh, we'll, we'll open it for questions after his talk. Uh, but with that, uh, Minister De Broome, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. <clears throat> I'm honored for, for the opportunity to speak uh, with you this afternoon, uh, the arrangements of the American Security Project. As we get to learn 
more of our warming world. A country's security is first and foremost a function of its location, its surroundings, and its environmental conditions. I come from a country made up of more than a thousand tiny coral atoll islands scattered across a million square miles of the Pacific Ocean. While known at the United Nations as a, one of the world's small island nations, we are in reality a large ocean nation. We are home to a thriving culture that has spanned millennia. Our identity, our economy, and our way of life are inextricably tied to the waters that surround us. Many of you here may recognize my country from the strategic role it played for the United States during World War II. Situated right in the middle of the Pacific, our islands were the site of some of the most fierce battles fought between the United States and Japan after Pearl Harbor. Soon after the World War II ended, our islands witnesses, witnessed 67 nuclear tests between 1946 and 1958. The most powerful of them, the Bravo shot, was the largest nuclear test ever conducted by the United States. I was there. Just nine years old at the time, I was fishing with my grandfather early in the morning, as it was customary, for a chat that run in schools along the beaches. When suddenly there was an enormous flash on the horizon, within seconds the entire sky had turned red. And I like to describe it to friends as, as if you were under a glass bowl and someone poured blood over it. The explosion was a thousand times more powerful than the one that uh, hit Hiroshima. But despite that horror, the pain and disease in this location, my country managed to survive. We went on to fight for justice and ultimately won our independence. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I never imagined years ago that I was at the UN fighting for my country's independence, that I would be back decades later fighting for a new agreement to avert a new crisis that once again threatens the survival of my country. Lying just two meters above sea level in the vast blue expanse of the Pacific, we are literally at the mercy of the rising waves and the wicked storms that are the symptoms of our warming earth. In 2013, we declared two separate national emergencies due to unseasonal droughts in the Northern Islands and the inundation of our capital, Majuro, in the south which forced hundreds of Marshallese to move their homes. This, he, this year has been no different. Typhoon Nanka in July left us with a 4.2 million damage bill, around 3% of my country's GDP. When I returned from last month's UN General Assembly, I was welcomed home by yet another unprecedented tropical storm that brought more than 150 millimeters of rain and unprecedented gale force winds from the west, a new phenomenon that our buildings and infrastructure are not built to endure. Even my own home was under what I call climate attack with a, a former fishing boat, a, a, 50, a 40, 50 foot, 90 ton fishing boat, breaking its mooring and trying to make itself uh, part of my living room furniture. But this is the climate reality of now. As my president says, it has become like living in a war zone. Our situation is dire but not unique. Every corner of the globe has already been touched by climate change. Hurricanes Katrina and Isaac in New Orleans, Superstorm Sandy in New York, we can't say that one storm is caused by climate change, but their strength and frequency has increased exponentially. While the rich countries of the world have the money and resources to cope with these events, we in the most vulnerable countries simply can't afford 
to limp from one disaster to another. The storms and king tides we face can wipe out in just a few minutes the development gains we have painstakingly made over decades. Put simply, the effects of climate change are already here and they are devastating. Our history books tell us that the consequences when we sit idly as our enemy marches forward. Today, one of those enemies is climate change. Without strong and concerted climate action, the situation we face will be as dire and as serious as civil war, terrorism, and nuclear weapons. Retired Admiral Locklear, who served as the head of the U.S. Pacific Command, PACOM, has said that climate change would cripple the security environment, probably more likely than the other scenarios we all often talk about. Under former Defense Secretary Hagel's leadership, the Pentagon released the report confirming that climate change would be a threat multiplier across the world, a descriptor supported recently by NATO. And just last week, I was heartened to see a full-page ad in the Wall Street Journal in which a bipartisan coalition of former U.S. military and diplomatic leaders called on the U.S. to lead in the fight against the greatest security challenge the world has ever faced. With experts from all corners surrounding the alarm bells, it baffles me that there is still a partisan battle in the United States on whether or not to tackle the problem head on. I will continue to challenge my good friends in Congress to sit down with me and hear my people's story. I will remind them that if my country goes, so too will U.S. military interests and bases in the Marshall Islands, which is home to the Ronald Reagan ballistic missile defense site on Kwajalein, our largest atoll, and my constituency, a point that is certainly not lost to Pentagon, to the Pentagon, who I know have been doing their own assessment of sea level rise and other climate events there. That is why it beggars relief that a Congress that goes along with the lease for Kwajalein out to 2086 plus 20, which is 28, yeah, 2066 plus 20, would at the same time seek to block U.S. participation in an international agreement designed to address the major threat to that asset. Moreover, we must not forget what we agreed to in our compact of free association between the United States and the Marshall Islands. The U.S. is obligated to defend the Marshall Islands and its people from attack or threats thereof as the United States and its citizens are defended. We have upheld our end of that bargain. Since our scouts participated in the Japanese campaign of World War II with the United States forces, until today, with our Marshallese sons and daughters fighting in defense of the United States where duty calls, whether it be in Iraq or in Afghanistan. We now ask the United States to uphold its end of that bargain and fight in defense of the Marshall Islands. After all, it is a matter of legal opportunity that the U.S. treat the security threats to our islands as if they were their own. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> as world leaders descend on Paris in less than a month, they would be tasked with one of the greatest diplomatic undertakings the world has ever faced. After more than two decades of literally failed democracy, I mean, sorry, failed diplomacy, we are for the first time on track to secure a new global agreement with broad participation from all the major players. 
That we are close is in no small part testament to the leadership that Obama administration has shown on the issue, not only in forging a new climate action policy, but also in making a Paris Agreement one of the country's major diplomatic objectives, both at the White House and in the State Department. It is no longer possible for anyone to argue that the U.S. is going it alone. In preparation for Paris, more than 150 countries have brought forward intended nationally determined contributions, INDCs they're called, or proposed emission reduction targets, covering more than 90% of global emissions. Even my own country, which barely registers at 0 0.0001 degree uh, uh, percentage of global emissions, is doing more than its fair share in that effort. In July, we released our own INDC, which contained the first economy-wide emissions reduction target that any developing country has undertaken. Our message has been very clear. If we can do it, so can you. And as a result, we saw a target from Brazil that was designed after ours. The Brazilian minister's words, not mine. <clears throat> Despite all this, we're still well short of being able to declare victory. Based on proposed targets, the projections are that we are still on a track for a 2.5, 2.7 degrees Celsius rise in global temperature by the end of the century. This is well beyond the previously agreed 2 degrees Celsius limit, and even more so beyond the 1.5 degree limit that vulnerable countries such as mine are calling in order to avoid the worst impacts. So success in Paris will ultimately be determined by whether the agreement is designed for ambition. Designed for ambition. By this, I mean two key design features. <clears throat> First, the Paris Agreement needs to establish a long-term objective consistent with the science. In other words, the Paris Agreement needs a quantitative decarbonization pathway that translates into practical terms what will be required to limit warming to below 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade. The Marshall Islands has called for a net zero emissions goal by mid-century. This would send a clear signal to governments and private actors across the world that low, the low carbon era has arrived. In essence, this will establish our long-term strategy in the climate battle. Secondly, <clears throat> the agreement must include a dynamic ambition mechanism that brings parties back to the table every five years to reassess and deepen their targets. We must be nimble in this battle and have the option of changing course when the conditions on the field change. By this I mean new climate science that will emerge and the new technological developments with it. To exemplify the, la la exemplify the latter point, could we have imagined just five years ago that we could see an 80% drop in the price of solar energy? We simply cannot predict the advances that will be made in clean technology in the coming years. That is why we should not attempt to. By returning to the table at frequent intervals, we ensure that new targets continue to be set on the basis of absolute best technology available. Ladies and gentlemen, as we enter the final phase of the Paris negotiations, I will be doing everything I can to fight the good fight for my people and the rest of the world. As I like to say, if we save the Marshall Islands, we save the planet. This is the critical transformation that we are witnessing in how today's states think about both climate change and security. That it is all in our individual self-interest to cooperate and not to compete in a zero-sum game. Climate change 
is a security challenge that demands international cooperation and global solidarity of the highest order. I appreciated the new ASP report's description of effective climate diplomacy as being a force multiplier. Thank you. It most certainly is. International cooperation on climate change is not some idealistic utopian dream. It is simply a matter of the states of the world acting rationally to ensure that the most basic, most essential characteristic of sovereignty are guaranteed, national security and survival. Thank you very much. Mr. DeBrum, thank you. I think we can have a seat and we have a, a little bit of a dialogue and, and uh, then open it for questions. Uh, security is a function of location. Uh, I like that. Large and, and not a small island state, but a large ocean nation. Uh, I think that that's appropriate and, and a, a, a good... Uh, good thing for us all to take away. Um, I was surprised by your, uh, your numbers uh, saying a single typhoon, 3% of GDP. Uh, I mean, that is, uh, that's living in a war zone, as you say. Uh, can you explain more uh, how that's harming the, the country? <clears throat> the recent uh, changes in, 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 in climate in the Marshalls. And when I talk about the Marshalls, please, uh, I want to specifically point out that the situations that I described there are almost identical in Kiribati, in Tuvalu, in, uh, in uh, Tokelau, uh, in some of our uh, neighbors in the Indian Ocean, as well as some islands in the Caribbean. Uh, a lot of people see the Federated States of Micronesia, for example, uh, because of their mountains, don't realize that they have 39 atoll communities mm -hmm. in the FSM. Mm -hmm. So they are just as much threatened as we are. Uh, we have droughts, severe droughts in the north, northern part of the country, and then we have floods on the southern part. For instance, we've had to distribute drinking water and food in some of the northern driest seasons, driest areas for the last two years. In the south, uh, the island of Bikini, of, of, of Kili, where the Bikini people now live, is threatened to the point where we're working closely with the Interior Department to secure their relocation wow. to a safer spot, perhaps even in the United States. Um, <clears throat> so, in, in the case of Kili, for example, water is not in, uh, only covering the island from the embankments. And this is a single island that sits out in the middle of the Pacific. But it's also springing up from the dirt from underneath. So it's affecting the landing strip, but also affecting, uh, affecting the, uh, the landing uh, area, the, the ocean side, where a, a channel was built from, from the edge of the reef to the, to the beach on the leeward side. But now the leeward side has become the windward side. Huh. So if we cannot access them to deliver food because the island cannot support the population and we cannot access them by air, uh, they are in pretty bad shape. Uh, we just had a good meeting with the Interior Department two hours ago to discuss this matter. But <clears throat> all of these are happening now. The, the money for adaptation and for, for creating resilience is slow in coming. We have identified the need. The science has uh, confirmed the the, the, the fact that this is going to be a recurring event for, for some time. <clears throat> and, excuse me, we still cannot uh, marry up the resource with the target need in order to make some progress in, <clears throat> excuse me, creating assurances and confidence that eventual demise of the islands are not going to follow. <clears throat> We're working on capacity building. There has never been a time in my memory, and I've been doing this for a long time, where cooperation <clears throat> between the United States 
and the Marshalls have been so close. <clears throat> Not just close, but um, in need of, of constant uh, refueling. <clears throat> because climate change, uh, the, the solutions, therefore, are here and must be employed now. Otherwise, catching up and applying those technologies and solutions at a later time is going to become almost cost prohibitive. <clears throat> if we did it quickly, if we, if we did not wait, for example, until 2020, but started to move on cooperative efforts to deal with this problem now, including what we call climate-proofing public buildings, for example, creating shelters, creating places where people can flee in, 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 in times of emergencies where you can have secure uh, access to water or medicines or other emergency needs. Uh, an early warning system <clears throat> that, is, uh, that is capable of warning people ahead of time. All of these things must be put in place. But those are some of the issues that now uh, must be funded by our already meager resources. If you take money away from education and health in order to fund climate change uh, uh, programs, then we become even more less, even less effective in providing the basic mandated constitutional services. Uh, one more question before I open it to the, to the audience here. Um, uh, actually, talking about, uh, about government revenue, one of, one of uh, a big part of, of Marshall Island's uh, revenue is, is uh, your ship registry. Yes. Uh, and you've, you've talked uh, fairly recently about uh, Marshall Islands might reject oil rig registrations. Um, there's been a big push here in the United States and, and uh, the UK and other uh, large uh, developed nations uh, to have major institutions divest from fossil fuels, divestment campaigns and everything like that. Um, do you think that this is something that uh, you all may get pressed on, it may have, may do, and, and would it be oil rigs or um, oil tankers or anything like that, or is, is this something that you all have considered, would consider thinking about? We, uh, that's a very good question, and, and just yesterday we were uh, also questioned on that uh, okay. in, in, in London. Rather than being pressed to bring up this issue, we, as the third largest uh, ship registry in the world, actually raised the issue. We brought it to the attention of the IMO, that the IMO, uh, International Maritime Organization, is the only such organization that polices its own. Don't worry about it, gang. Uh, leave it to us. We'll take care of our own pollution problems. We'll mm -hmm. take care of our own modernization mm -hmm. problems. We'll take care of our own uh, 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 paint and, and security issues. The Marshall Islands, as a registry, has the responsibility to make sure, for example, that shipping is safe, that it does uh, reduce uh, emissions, that it, but it must do so in consort with other regist registry services. Otherwise, it places us in a, in, a, in a situation where if people don't want to comply with our environmental mm -hmm. regs, they just simply move on to another uh, registry. In order for this to work, it must be something adopted by everyone on an equal basis. Everybody has an even playing field. And if you say, by a year, such and such, you must have engines that do not use this much uh, or sulfur or, you know, uh, in your fuel, et cetera, et cetera. All of those can be harmonized in such a way that we can all reduce IMO mm -hmm. emissions. But the way it is now, IMO is saying, uh, UNFCCC, you do your own thing and we'll do our own, and if we happen to meet at the end of the lane, that'd be fine. But if it doesn't, well, give us more time, and we'll, we'll steer our ships across uh, that, that line at some point. That is the unacceptable part. Mm. But it is not uh, from pressure to us that we have raised this issue. It is something that we recognize seeing what we have on our registry list, number, number one. Number two, we have advocated that we actually <coughs> defossilize uh, so if you, act, if you, have, you don't have people investing in, in oil wells, hopefully that will, re, that will speed up that process. We want to see 
zero emissions, uh, zero, uh, de total decarbonization by 2050, if this whole exercise is going to make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll open it up to, uh, to questions here. Uh, Lisa first, and then, then in front of you. Jerry, yeah, we're, wait for the microphone. It's coming. Uh, and we'll, uh, <coughs> thank you. And identify yourself for Lisa the, the Friedman crowd. from Climate Wire. I write for an energy policy magazine here. Um, thanks, Minister. I, I was wondering if you could talk about some of the discussions on finance that are happening in the negotiations. Um, what specifically do island nations want to see? Um, things were left in a pretty precarious position the last round in Bonn. And could you also ring in on, on you know, I, mean, I think there's a debate happening. We heard a lot of develop, developing countries say, hey, developed countries are trying to put the, the pressure on us to give money to the Green Climate Fund or to be able to if you're in a position to do so. Um, is, that, is there an objection to that across developing countries or are there countries like yours that would like to see a Brazil or a Saudi Arabia or a Singapore put money into the Green Climate Fund? <clears throat> Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Lisa is a good friend. We um, we see the the um, the experience of Copenhagen to dictate a little bit of how <coughs> how countries must look at the Green Climate Fund and our commitment to the Green Climate Fund must must be secured. We were talking then about a hundred billion dollar climate green green climate fund. Which is now how much? 30, 37, maybe. Um, <clears throat> it 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 falls far short of what was promised to be a, a a level of funding that would allow for two things: uh, a a marriage of mitigation and adaptation, adaptation in, in especially for the developing countries. And secondly, the assurances, if the trajectories keep talking about three degrees and not two degrees, there needs to be speeded up uh, 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 adaptation and, and, and uh, program to, to create resilience among those most vulnerable states. And to short circuit the, the line. In other words, if you've got 190 countries lining up for this Green Climate Fund, Guess who's going to be at the tail end? The most vulnerable. For, for obvious reasons. This economies of scale, population, uh, distances, uh, just capacity to, to do what must be done. <clears throat> it's important for the developing uh, countries and for the most uh, vulnerable states to have some assurance, some confidence that, for example, that we can carry back to our our own people and our own constituencies, that even if what happens in Paris does not guarantee a 1.5 or 2, there will be the opportunity to fix it, the so-called ambition, the agreement on, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with ambition, and this regular five-year cycle of review. But there are also those that feel that there must be a special, special attention paid to long uh, or, or what they call uh, uh, um, slow onset issues. Uh, uh, climate <clears throat> has on, for example, coral bleaching, ocean acidification, which affect <clears throat> now the resources that make these countries capable of taking care of themselves. And if those are threatened now, how much more threatened would they be at a later time? As you've, seen, you've identified uh, accurately, Vanuatu <clears throat> lost almost 80% of its, of its uh, working economic and, and social infrastructure with that one storm. That one storm. <clears throat> the vulnerable countries and the, and, the, and the least developed, the LDCs, are saying they should, be an, they should address this separately and in a way that can assure them that, it's, that signing on to an agreement in Paris just does not push that problem backwards again allowing the, the, the <clears throat> polluters to continue to pollute because we're buying time instead of looking at the other way around. We're going to invest in, in, in adaptation even now to make sure that mitigation is possible by all. 
I think <clears throat> also that there are those countries that may feel that uh, discussions surrounding the issue of, for example, loss and damage uh, uh, immediately sends up flags and, and horns saying, oh, uh, the vulnerable states are looking for uh, deep pockets and, a, and an endless source of, of cash that they can pull in to do their own thing. Uh, all un under the, uh, the guise of, of climate change protection and all of this. This <clears throat> is not something that we, we, we agree with. We think that we are, well, there are some legitimate internal concerns of some of the big developed countries on how to deal with this problem. But that that should not spook people into running away from the main uh, interest of a climate agreement that we, we should all agree on. And that we can work on language, we can look, work on location, we can work on how to do this in such a way that, uh, that everyone moves forward in, in, in a harmonized manner in achieving a climate change uh, treaty or a climate change agreement. The other, uh, the other issue that I think that, that should be taken into account is there are some solutions out there. There's, uh, there's already a, uh, a Warsaw mechanism for, for dealing with this. That's basically a, uh, still in frame, mm -hmm. no flesh added yet, but that can be, that can be worked on. Also, <clears throat> the, uh, the UK, for example, has been talking uh, a lot about, uh, about the insurance scheme, a wider regional insurance scheme that would, that would allow for some assurance that some of these things can be handled that way. But <clears throat> it's important that just as all these countries that are actively pursuing a, a robust agreement in Paris are saying there shall be no finger pointing if somebody fails to live up to its commitments under the treaty. That that same kind of thought applies to there should be no finger pointing in terms of saying liability or you are the cause because that will derail the whole exercise. And we want to assure people that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at something that can be acceptable to all different ends of the continuum, but still guarantee that there is a climate change agreement that we can all be proud of and work to improve after that. Thank you. Sir, uh, in front here, wait for the uh, microphone. Thank you very much. Um, Georges Mihais, I'm a member for UNESCO Task Force, and I came across the project of small island states. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know about it. Uh, last year was an international conference. Uh, my question is, uh, in order to mitigate the impact of climate change, so I will not address the macroeconomic who is paying and so on. Uh, I, I'm skeptical about uh, Paris. I'm French national. Mm -hmm. uh, these are two big agreements to uh, be able to implement them, but this is my position. And I'm a Norwegian uh, resident, so Norway has been very active. My question is, uh, given that uh, today it seems there are available technologies to mitigate for uh, desalinization, small-scale desalinization, also local production at low cost, environmentally free uh, for fertilizer. You, are, you have small farmers, for instance. What would you see in cooperation probably with UNESCO and the World Bank, as well as American government, to initiate rather quickly a serious project to serve your farmers to build the economic capacity, as well as cultural capacity, um, to mitigate the impact uh, to build resilience, and in particular for tropical small islands, islands generally speaking, you can become today, if you move quickly enough in my opinion, uh, a sort of international center of competence. So more entrepreneurial, knowledge-based approach, uh, bottom-up, and I think your island qualifies for this. I'm talking desalinization, not big plants, uh, very small scale or fertilizer, very small scale, low cost, and manageable by small farmers. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank very interesting. Um, we are exploring all avenues to 
deal with. It's not just uh, a specific small farmer, as you say. Uh, when we had that meeting in Samoa last year, it was called SIDS, uh, Small Island Developing States UN meeting. Um, this was discussed at length. There are areas of the, of the vulnerable states throughout the Pacific that can uh, uh, gain from, from the kind of, uh, of uh, initiative that you, you discuss. And those are being looked at very carefully. Uh, uh, UNESCO is, of course, uh, uh, active in our part of the world. We have just added on UNIDO, and there are other, uh, of, of, again, thinking along the same lines. The biggest problem uh, with, uh, with assisting self-reliance amongst the, the, the uh, islands in the, in the vulnerable island communities is that we, for the most part, except for Papua New Guinea and perhaps maybe Fiji, Samoa to a lesser extent, most of these countries suffer from two basic lacks, and that is affordable energy and water. Almost everything that you're talking about uh, creating some kind of self-reliance self and self-sustainability depend on those two. And for as long as uh, fossil fuels are the source of our energy for, for life, I mean electricity for homes and, 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 and schools, as well as for our transport system, which is absolutely necessary. It's a lifeline of all the islands. You can't go and come without having something uh, on the sea being delivered or being taken away. Uh, this is going to always, always be an issue. So we're looking at the small uh, uh, methane generator here or the, or the, or the, uh, or the management of, of waste in such a way that you can create fertilizer and all those. We're, we're exploring all of those, but we're also not limiting ourselves to those small island community projects. We're also looking at larger technology. For instance, we've been campaigning for some years now on reintroducing the concept of OTEC, or Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, which we are now uh, engaged with the French and with the, uh, with the United States uh, sources as well to try our, our, for example, our country, the Marshalls, and my constituency specifically is, has been rated by all of the technicians looking at this technology as one of the best, best uh, uh, places in the world to, to establish it. We have a very high uh, surface to 1,000 meter temperature differential, D minus, they call it that will allow for this kind of technology to develop. Of course, it's initially very expensive, so people are reluctant. It may be something that qualifies for the Green Climate Fund uh, uh, te technical and, and financial assistance. But the, the point is that we have an opportunity here to not only de uh, decarbonize and, 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 and wean ourselves from fossil fuels, but also create a new a new environment where the, just the provision of, of, of a level of comfort in the life of the islands is, is uh, doable even with the onslaught of, of climate change challenges. But also we will be contributing to global reduction in emissions by allowing this, this kind of technology to develop. If you have this technology, for example, in the Marshalls, uh, in, in fiscal 2014, we exported from our anchorage, from the port of Majuro, $1.8 billion worth of raw tuna, mostly to China, mostly to China. Because if that, if that amount of fish was allowed to be processed within, say, Kiribati, Tuvalu, Marshalls, or FSM, you would not have need anymore for the high level of subsidy that we receive from our development partners just to run our basic uh, services mandated by Constitution. If we can somehow get this kind of thinking to merge into the, 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 the views of those who will be in charge of the Green Climate Fund and how that works out, we can revolutionize that way of living. 
a lot of people report, well, for example, in the Marshalls, we have almost 99% now solarization of all communities, island com home communities in the Outer Islands. That's not a minor task if you consider we have to spread this equipment over a million square miles of oceans. But the fact that they have now solar power and solar lights in the Outer Islands is a big, big, big contributor to raise the level of comfort, the level of life of the people there. Now you don't have to clean kerosene lamps to do your homework at night. The kids love that. We hope it translates to their GPAs also uh, in, in time. But <clears throat> the important thing is we are not leaving a stone unturned in trying to find ways to cope with that and, and to use whatever resources that may be available to us to provide for the small. And in the Marshall, it's not so much farmers as it is fishermen, for example. We're introducing uh, fish farming techniques and, and other ways of, of keeping up with that technology to make sure that, that we do, uh, that we do uh, keep that, tech, uh, that uh, available as another source, as an alternate source, an option for our fishermen. Um, <clears throat> if, the, if you took the coastline of the greater Micronesia, the geographical Micronesia, from Palau to Kiribati, that's the third largest, third longest coastline in the world. Third only to the United States and Australia. One would think Malaysia or Indonesia or the Philippines, but that's not the case. We have the third largest coastline in the world. And we produce 54% of the world's tuna. In the eight countries, they make up the parties to the Nauru Agreement. We can either add value to that production by not just sending out raw tuna, but actually processing it or, or sending it out in, in higher marketing forms. Or we can succumb to climate change and lose that shoreline. Losing that shoreline means the demise of that tuna. If we deprive the world of 54% of the world's tuna by 2030 or 2040, that's a major shock that I think will need to be considered in anybody's policy book on climate change. Interesting. Glad to hear you, you talk about OTEC. That's a, a great, uh, under I think, underserved uh, area. Excellent. Other questions? Uh, back here. Hi, uh, Esther Babson. I actually work for the American Hotel Association, but I'm also in graduate school at Hopkins for Global Security Studies. And um, obviously, we talk, discussed about how funding is a major challenge. Um, but do you anticipate that the Marshall Islands and similar islands will um, consider and start working towards purchasing land, as Kiribati has done? As a community, with good question, as a community that has been the subject of massive displacement of population, even within our own jurisdiction. The thought of yet another displacement is not relish. We just spoke earlier about the people of Bikini now, having been moved from Bikini to Kili, wanting to move now from Kili to the United States, just for their own survival. Uh, <clears throat> so we, and also to say now if, that we are not thinking about that, eventual possibility uh, would be a betrayal of, 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 of my constitutional mandate to, to be a prudent government leader and also you know, keep that in mind. But you will not hear me say that too much in public uh, because we do not think that it contributes uh, uh, to the, the idea that we should control climate change rather than say now, okay, we'll solve that by declaring defeat and moving people off. The concept of purchasing land in Fiji, for example, has occurred to us, purchasing land in, in FSM, or leasing land long term, for the production of food, where our food production becomes a challenge. But we have not considered that sort of as a, as a, uh, as a alternative for, um, for actually moving people. Now, we should all bear in mind that under the agreement between the Marshall Islands and the United States, we have access to the United States and can, in fact, uh, move here. 
But uh, in spite of the fact that many, many people have indeed moved here, we have a large Marshallese community in uh, Springfield, Springdale, Arkansas. Um, most people would prefer to be close to their homeland. That's our soul. Island people, uh, many people think, well, it's just so easy, it's easy to pick up all the people from Kwajalein and put them in Wyoming and problem <laughs> solved. It's not quite that simple. Even within the Marshall Islands, moving one, one community from here to there is, is, is a major, uh, major uh, uh, social uh, 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 event of, 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 of huge consequences. The people of Rongola, for example, still have not been resettled because of the testing. They now live in Kwajalein. But even though they're all relatives of Kwajalein people, Living in Kwajalein is still putting them in exile because they're living in land to which they do not belong. I say that very carefully. They're living on land to which they do not belong because we have a sense of belonging to the land rather than the land belonging to us. Everybody takes care of his land for the next generation because of that reason. And, and so the thought of moving away from the Marshalls is not, is not uh, yet a matter of, of open and, 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 and free discussion, although it's in the back of minds of most people, that if this continues, you know, if, if in Fiji, for example, the waves start coming into your living room, you just move your, your house up a few feet and you're okay. But when you're sitting two meters above sea level, and on this side is the ocean, on this side is the lagoon, if you move away from the lagoon far enough, you'll be closer to the ocean, so you'll be back to danger again. The prime minister of uh, Tuvalu, a good friend of ours, said it in New York uh, recently. He said, I appreciate very much the help that the uh, USAID program is providing for early warning systems throughout the islands. But in Tuvalu, if the siren goes off, where do I run? If the waves come in, I'll find a surfboard and maybe a rosary, because that would be my best protection. And while it, it may sound a little bit, uh, he's speaking reality here. Uh, if the siren goes off, there are not too many places you can run away in an atoll situation. But I appreciate that question very much. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two more questions here. So maybe I'll take both of these, and then you can answer in turn. Excellent. So first you here, sir, and then and you. Uh, Henry Hedker, researcher, now retired federal government. Uh, I thought I'd just bring up something I've seen on CCTV. Uh, the Chinese government is assisting Nigeria in the Bay of Lagos uh, by placing seawalls around some of the islands in the large bay already. 15-foot uh, seawalls have been erected. Uh, the island is ringed and the water can't encroach any further than it already has uh, due to the walls. Uh, it requires a somewhat a change in lifestyle. Uh, your islands are different, but I wondered, have you considered this? The Chinese were also considering to put a, a wall around the entire bay uh, to protect uh, the villages uh, you know, along it, and the city, of course, of Lagos itself. Uh, I wondered, could this possibly be done in your area? Uh, you mentioned the tuna and the coral reefs. Uh, there's other considerations, but uh, it's a possibility, I think. What, what are your plans on so Have you thought of this, and what would your plans possibly be? Hold on. Yeah, sure. The second question here. Jim Kamasinski, Swiss Mountain Energy Consulting. I was just curious, how many of your islands have central electric generation grids or systems, and uh, of the ones that do, how do you generate that electricity now? Is it fossil fuels, uh, wind, solar, uh, and uh, also desalinization? How do you, how many islands have to have systems to do that, and what fuels do you use for that? That's all. So your electric grid and a great seawall of China. Let me, let me answer the last one first. Sure. Is that okay? Sure. Um, all our electricity for the main uh, grid are all diesel powered. 
and we're charging in the two capital communities of the Marshalls in Majuro and in Kwajalein, 43 cents a kilowatt hour. It's costing us closer to 60. So figure we're subsidizing every kilowatt, about 20 cents worth. Um, the desalinization that occurs in both Majuro and, and, and Kwajalein uh, is diesel powered as well. So you're using your 60, 60 cents uh, per kilowatt electricity to do that. OTEC would solve, solve that problem. Ocean thermal energy, if you reduce it below 25 cents or even below 20 cents, you're talking about affordable energy for all and water that can actually power our uh, fisheries and tourism sectors. Um, the Chinese do have a knack for building walls, don't they? Uh, recently in the Spratleys, they've been building airstrips uh, on, on, uh, on coral heads. Uh, and that suggestion has been made. At the end of World War II, you, you remember the Tuvalu, Kiribati, and the Marshes were the front end of the American wave moving towards Japan. Uh, at the, at the uh, declaration of security for each one of the islands, there was a lot of diesel and a lot of uh, heavy equipment left behind. So a lot of islands were connected by causeways to build up land. In other words, not upwards, but uh, outward. In other words, you have two islands here that are surrounding a lagoon, they would connect them. In the case of Kwajalein, there's several cases like that, uh, Taroa in the Gilberts, Punafuti, in, and, and elsewhere throughout the Pacific. The Marines and the, and the Seabees were very good at that. Today, as climate change affects and uh, the water rises and, uh, and uh, tidal waves, uh, not tidal waves, but the uh, um, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, the tides affect the, uh, the areas that were filled in in this process are the most vulnerable. And guess what? All of the capital of Majuro is exactly that. Several islands linked together by causeways. Anahuetak is the same. Kwajalein, of course, more than 60% of the island of Kwajalein is landfill. The ocean will always be the conqueror here. The ocean will always find the weakest point to penetrate because it's been there all this time. And there, they, therefore, if you do this, if you just raise this island up and the, and the waves come here and they can't, they can't touch you, they'll just go around and hit the next guy on either side in an even worse condition than, than here. So you have to build everybody up all at the same time. You cannot just build some islands up and leave other islands staying at two, two degrees. So it's, it's an expensive uh, proposition. We've been talking to people in the middle, in, uh, in, in the UA, UAE, uh, in China as well. Uh, we've also been talking about platforms, giant concrete platforms made up of uh, honeycomb formation so that they could withstand pressure and, and high winds and tides, and actually building public facilities on those, hospitals, schools, uh, fish processing, so that they would go up with the tide as well. That's also being considered. In Kiribati right now, because, because Taroa happens to have one of the most shallow lagoons in the world, it's a larger lagoon, but it's shallow, so there's a lot of fill there that, that people have identified can be used. Uh, the, the Dutch of the Netherlands are uh, working cooperatively with them to, to do that exactly what you're saying. So, uh, but not building seawalls that would just divert the, the flow of the water and not do anything about pre preventing the, the inundation of those islands. But we're looking at all options and we're sharing uh, these concerns with, with our, our, our good partners from, from, especially from the U.S. as I said now, uh, we have someone from Todd Stern's office in the State Department with us. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate this. Um, and we work very closely with them on, on aspects of the UNFCC's look at climate change, but we're also keeping in mind where the opportunities might be to help uh, mitigate and help adapt to, to some of these problems. There is a, a general good feeling of working together in this. 
it's important that we translate it to, 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 to Paris. I might add, uh, you said you were from France. We have very very close working relationship also uh, with your foreign minister, Laurent Fabius, and also his very able assistant, uh, uh, with, whom, with whom we met yesterday. Um, they are very keen to have something good come out of Paris. Norway is a very good supporter of the small island vulnerable states, has been for a long time. And we're all trying to go in together in a, with, a, with, a, with a unified, harmonious voice that says, this must be done. We know that there will be some things left un undone, but we hope that we can convince them to do this. Uh, we will also work with our, our good friends in the United States and Congress. I have a meeting there after this to, to also bring this message to them. We need everybody's uh, cooperation, and I think that with an occasion like this, we have made progress in spreading the word. And perhaps if all of us here went and told one or two friends, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll, good, uh, we'll be uh, doing a good thing. So once again, thank you so very much for thank having you. me. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, Foreign Minister Tony Abram. Thank you. Uh, go to our website, americansecurityproject.org. You'll be able to see the video and, and lots of other of our, our research on this topic and many others. Uh, thank you all for coming, and, and we'll hope to see you soon.